Victor Marcel Vega completed his residency on oncology at Johns Hopkins Hospital School of Medicine. I think some of you have heard of the place. Not too cheesy. He's board certified radiation oncologist. He taught at, as a professor at University of Washington, um, Washington University in St. Louis and University of Miami in Florida. He is the presently an assistant professor at the Universidad Central del Caribe School of Medicine in Puerto Rico. And he is now practicing starting Monday at the Casanis Institute in Dallas, Hughes and Dallas and Hughes Center in Naples, Florida. It's in Naples, Florida or in Dallas? No, it's in Dallas and in Naples. Right. Okay. So um, I'm just so, so happy that he was able to make it. And you are blessed because you get to hear him speak. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Blanche and everyone. I wasn't expecting that, so uh, that's very nice. It, it really speaks a lot about your group here, so thank you. And uh, I'm still in shock from that, but thank you very much. But anyways, every time I, I come to Houston, I love it because I feel at home. There's so much Spanish that, that is spoken from the moment I open the car door. So that's the good thing about Houston, that it's so close to the United States. So, <laughs> so let's get started with this. Uh, by the way, I've been in the Cozzani's Institute in Dallas working for two weeks now, and I apply for my medical license in Texas. So that process is going well, thank God. And I started in the Hughes Center on Monday. So these people have, have had the, the heart to receive me. So it's been a lot of fun. And now it's great, too, because the, uh, the tolerance for bullshit has gone down to zero in the last five weeks. And vice versa, mine, too. So don't think it's <laughs> from the outside. It's also from here. So anyways, we're going to talk about the detoxification and regeneration in the management of disease. Because as a radiation oncologist, we're not taught any of this, unfortunately. And the medical schools are incredibly deficient about teaching something that most of you are well aware of that uh, has to be found and treated in our patients. Otherwise, we're, we don't get the results in most chronic diseases. And you're way ahead of the curve by the uh, dental health issues with root canals and et cetera, et cetera. So, we, uh, for example, I went uh, three weeks, four weeks ago, I went to the Radiation Oncology National Meeting looking for a job. Going back to Radiation Oncology to see what they were doing. And, and they're going backwards. They're not going even forward. They're going backwards in terms of the uh, implementation of nutrition, detoxification, exercise, stress reduction, regeneration, stem cells. They're, they're even going backwards. They had more papers and presentations of exercise than they did in this meeting in San Diego. So I went there to look for jobs. There are jobs available, but I said, if, if I get into any of these jobs, I get a heart attack in four months. I mean, it's, it's misery. It's like going back in time for you that know what's going on with all these issues to 30 years ago. So unfortunately, that's happening, but not in our medical school. Yeah, and our medical school, by the way, we're now asking the physicians from the schools in Puerto Rico to come to Dallas and Miami for training, and we're paying them for the training. We're not charging them. We're paying them. So we're doing a different concept. Usually somebody charges you for training. So we're paying them like they were residents. So this is what's happening right now. That's a, so you can uh, spread the word for us. And as you know, the planet is a blending machine. So nothing is in a compartment. We think that Vieques in Puerto Rico is more polluted than Florida, but we don't see how the hurricane or any wind carries what's in our, con in our island to Florida. The wind goes uh, westwardly and northerly constantly. And the whole planet is mixing everything that we put in the air and the water and the food. And as, as you see, we're totally addicted to oil, and that's the main poison that we have to deal with in our practices, day in and day out, that promotes everything else, not just uh, 
the deposition of uh, petroleum products, but also these things, ha these fuels have heavy metals in them, and unfortunately, they act also as uh, hormonal mimickers. So they mimic hormones and they give other problems. And of course, pesticides come from this, petroleum products. So pesticides, heavy metals, and oil-based situations is what's causing most chronic diseases in the world. And <clears throat> would you eat something that has that sign in it? <laughs> Thank God I went uh, plant-based about four or five months ago, completely plant-based. I don't want to eat animals anymore. However, if you don't chew 30 times, you're going to look like you're dying which is what happened to me when I tried to go plant-based years ago without knowing that I had to chew properly. If you don't get that nutrition from the plants, it's very hard to digest them. So you can digest them. So you have to chew 30 times. You know who taught me that? Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gabba, Gabby in uh, the American Academy of Holistic and Integrative Medicine. So when he said that and I started chewing 30 times, I said, well, this is the ticket. We can do this and not starve, finally. Okay, this is probably one of the most important slides that I have uh, had the opportunity to integrate into my lectures because this is the President's Cancer Panel Report of 2010 on environmental exposure to the 84,000 chemical substances that were exposed to in pla on planet Earth and especially in the United States. President Obama commissioned this study in 2008-2009 he told the National Institutes of Health, the National Cancer Institute, and the Department of Health and Human Services. You see them here. Those are the three authors of this 250-page study. I recommend that you go to the Internet today. You can ask for a free copy as an American citizen. They'll send it to you. Get a few hardbound copies, also download it. And these are the most conservative agencies related to cancer treatment and cancer diagnosis and health promotion in the United States. They're the most conservative, but they're also the, uh, uh, the people that most doctors follow. These are the uh, entities that, uh, the authorities, that's the word. These are the authorities. So that's what's interesting about this. So the panel found, Obama knew there was information they were sitting on for 10 years. So this report was ready for many years. We don't know how many years. We think it was 20 year, 10 years. And President Bush didn't want to release the report. He's from Texas. The main uh, product from Texas is oil, of course. This is just an uh, assumption. I really don't have any proof for that. But what I do know is that immediately after Obama came in, a few months later, the report got out. You don't get a report written that fast. And that report, the first thing that the report does is it says, Mr. President, the presence of 84,000 chemical substances in the United States and the world is probably causing most diseases that we're seeing, but we don't know exactly how many... Uh, how much are they contributing to that? However, the problem is, uh, the potential problem is so big, we're going to show you in a picture what's probably causing most cancer in the United States. And they put it in a picture. They said, this is, these are the causes of cancer. And this is like the fifth page of the report. It's a picture. And after the letter they sent to Obama, they put a picture. So you see, you don't see any genetics here, right? But if you ask most oncologists in the United States what causes cancer, they'll tell you it's genetic. Well, that, that's a bunch of uh, bull crap. It's basically this. Petroleum-based products, uh, chemicals in the water, in the air, in the food with pesticides and x-rays in hospitals. They didn't talk about heavy metals that much because, you know, the leaded gasoline was eliminated, but not the lead. The lead is still present, and we will see data supporting that from Puerto Rico and Vieques. But unfortunately, that goes in the air and the water, and we don't really know the extent of these things. But for them to recognize this, that most cancers are due to pollution, that's a major breakthrough. 
because that implies that we have to remove these things from our environment and our bodies, and that's why we're seeing the results of what we're seeing, the reversal of disease. So it's not just cancer. It's also high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, cataracts, glaucoma, Alzheimer's, autism, Parkinson's, major epidemic of neurological diseases like uh, ALS. ALS used to be rare, not anymore. Alzheimer's used to be relatively rare. It's the number one cause of death in England today. Did you know that? It's the number one cause of death in England. I mean, that was unheard of 10, 20 years ago. It's the fourth leading cause of death in Puerto Rico. It was number 15 a few years ago. Autism was one of 10,000 kids in the 80s. Today is one in 50. So these things are getting out of control. Uh, and we, of course, some vaccinations have been using preservatives like mercury and aluminum. We have to remove those things from vaccines. I don't need proof that, to know that these things have to be removed. And we'll talk about what are safe doses of these chemicals, if any. Because the implication of that is that, is there any safe quantity of anaerobic bacteria in the mouth? So it's the same with all these chemicals, heavy metals. We have to treat those safe quantities in the same way, and we'll talk about that in a little while. So now we have the Board of Integrative Medicine in the American Board of Physicians Specialties, because uh, usually the boards that are recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialists and the American Board of Medical Specialists has monopolized the boards, as well as the American Board of Osteopathic Physicians, as well as the American Board of Maxillofacial Surgery. Those three boards have monopolized the board business. And now you supposedly have to take a board every 10 years to be a good doctor, which is totally ridiculous, but this is happening. Fortunately, in Texas, legislature was passed in June, and the governor signed it that taking a board recertification, MOCs, every 10 years is total, a total waste of time and money. That doesn't prove that you're good or bad. So anyways, that's a good thing about Texas, besides being close to the United States in Houston. But, so as you can see, all academic institutions in the United States now have integrated medicine departments, all of them. Albert Einstein, MD Anderson, Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic has a whole building. So now they're starting to recognize it, uh, but unfortunately those centers uh, do maybe less than 5% of what we do in this room. They need to do more because most centers are doing massage, chiropractic, and acupuncture, which are very important, but it's 1% of the whole picture of integrated medicine. So fortunately, this is uh, happening slowly, but happening. <clears throat> In Puerto Rico, we've been looking into the amount of uh, lead and mercury in the population because just because I've been doing chelation therapy, intravenous chelation therapy since uh, 1995, for 22 years, I've been looking for ways of finding the metals because then I've been able to justify it to boards and medical schools and people that don't want you to do that. So I always wanted to justify the treatment by finding heavy metals in the person. And then you have a diagnosis of heavy metal toxicity and intravenous chelation therapy is totally justified, even by conservative groups. So we started doing that and ended up finding out a lot of interesting things. In the last uh, 10 years, more or less, we've been doing 24-hour urine collections of heavy metals. Because you know the standard is whole blood content of heavy metals. However, that would only give you an idea of what you have acutely. So what you've been exposed in the last 24 hours is not a very good measure of what's in the tissue and has been there for months or even years. So the blood, we don't use. We use a 24-hour urine with a challenge from chelation therapy, and I'll show you what that means. So in 52 patients that we did originally in Puerto Rico from 2008 to 2012, we found that in the urine of these patients, and this is a range of concentration in the urine in micrograms per gram, micrograms of heavy metal over grams of creatinine. 
So some tests will give you micrograms of heavy metal per cc of urine or milliliter of urine, which is okay too, but it can give you a different result because some people are drinking more water than others during the testing. But, the, but standardizing it to creatinine will give you a very accurate report so you can compare with other tests later. So we found in this population that 100% had presence of lead, 65% of mercury, 92% aluminum, 100% arsenic, cadmium 98%, gadolinium 71, and uranium 33. This one we weren't expecting. And it started making us pay more attention to where is this uranium coming from and looking towards the 60-year-old military base in Vieques, I don't know if you're aware of that, but the Navy has been practicing in Vieques, target practice, from the ships uh, for over 60 years. But to give you an idea of what really happened there, it's like a, a catalog for the whole world. Let's say you're from Israel or from Kenya. So you send your military to Vieques, they'll give you a menu, and the menu shows you what you can throw. Rockets, bombs, it's a menu. And, it, and the menu is for free if you just want to throw one. But if you want to throw a few, it's going to cost you. And if you buy, there's a discount. So that's how it works. And that's how the country start practicing. I say, I want 10 of these, 20 of those airplanes, and I want uranium-tipped uh, missiles. And that's where we started looking at, at this. So, of course, uh, they're making a, a bundle here. They probably were making 100 to $500 million a day with those catalogs. Anyways, that's just a side note. It has no relevance to some of these things. And we started doing pre- and post-chelation therapy 24-hour urine analysis because what we started seeing is that sometimes you will have a very little, relatively speaking, for example, aluminum here, pre-chelation was 0.131 micrograms per gram of creatinine. But after chelation therapy, it will go up to 77.4. So what that indicated is, uh, is that the tissue holds on to the metal. You don't get a true picture of how much you have. Plus, this shows me also if this chelation is working. So it's not only diagnosis, but this is treatment this technique of pre- and post-chelation therapy, 24-hour urine analysis. So that's also when we started seeing, well, nobody has uranium, but then after chelation, then we would see it. And in some cases, it will be the opposite. So we have no idea what this means. 0.91 of nickel before chelation and after chelation, no, de no detectable levels. But most of the situations will increase the excretion by using chelation therapy. So we've been using chelation in thousands of patients. We'll show that data because chelation is a very simple procedure that can help a lot of people. So again, provocation with chelation therapy. Uh, I recommend it rather than whole blood for what I told you already about. And uh, it, is both it is both diagnostic and therapeutic. So again, very difficult to diagnose di uh, concentrations of heavy metals in tissue unless a, unless a biopsy is done, which is very impractical. And uh, it's a potential mechanism of disease. We know that, heavy metals. Uh, and unfortunately, th this is my 24-hour urine test. But what I wanted to show you here, this is from Genova Diagnostics. It's a great test. Gives you 20 heavy metals. Yellow is that, well, it's not that bad. The, the question is, what does not that bad mean? Mine are very low here. Most of them, this one is gadolinium. So I had gadolinium in the red area. And this is uranium. Everything is relative in life. So this is relativity, relative to the patients that Genova Diagnostics does the test to. So where do I fall in relation to other people in planet Earth? However, <clears throat> What does it mean in terms of health? If you go to the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA website will say what is safe, let's say, the most common heavy metal, lead. The safe levels 20 years ago was 70 micrograms per cc of blood, according to the EPA. They considered that safe. Then years later, it went down to 15. 
Then five to ten years later, it went down to five. Recently, the, the board, three, four years ago, recommended one microgram per cc in the blood is a safe level of lead. And in the last few years, all the committees have said the same thing of the EPA. So if you go to a website, they still haven't said it conclusively. They say, there's probably no safe level of, blood, of lead in the blood, which is true. The higher the level, the more you're going to see disease quicker. The lower the level, the more it's going to take you to see it. So you need more people and more time to see it. But that's the difference. It's a matter of dose, but it's not safe. So there's no safe level. There's probably no safe level of any of these chemical substances. So our duty and focus should be to remove them as much as we can. Even if we continue our exposure by breathing, by doing techniques with diet and supplements and chelation can reverse the majority of chronic diseases that we see. Not all of them, but the majority. So that's a very hopeful and important uh, fact. So I'm not going to go through the details here. This is a comparison of Vieques, where those practices were made, with the big island in Puerto Rico, uh, which is Puerto Rico itself the Big Island. And as you can see here, we compared the differences between the two. And the one I wanted you to see, I mean, the Big Island, well, lead is 100% of the ones we tested were positive, aluminum, uh, mercury. So they're not doing that great just because they're far away from Vieques. So we know that Explosions produce microparticles and the wind. We know that, have you heard of the Saharan uh, dust? How do you call that in English? Sahara dust or Sahara? Yeah. That comes from the Sahara and it goes thousands of miles across the Atlantic and it reaches Florida and Texas and Puerto Rico. So, of course, if you have explosions in Vieques, it's going to take... Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Florida, who knows where it goes. So we saw that in the, the very suspicious uranium. So uranium was seen in 26% of the population of Puerto Rico. Where is that uranium coming from? It didn't make any sense. So if it comes from Vieques, it should be higher. Well, lo and behold, in Vieques, which is down here, the percent of patients that had uranium in their urine was 75%. So that's very suggestive that that uranium is probably coming from the military practices in Vieques. And of course, it's diluting itself so you detect it less as you move further west. But it's a big problem because a lot of that uranium is probably radioactive, depleted. And then comparing the slides, the red one here is the amount of this one lead and aluminum in Vieques and lead and aluminum in the Big Island. So this is inverted. Should be the, the other way around. The red one is Vieques and lead and aluminum down here is from the Big Island. So we saw also a difference in lead and aluminum, not just uh, uranium. The difference in uranium is appreciated here. These are the different concentrations in the patients, so also the concentrations were higher, not just the incidence in the population that we tested, which was about 37 people in Vieques, but also the concentrations of uranium were higher. And of course, there's a, this is what some of the tank rounds, sabots, look like. This, is, uh, this tip is, is uh, depleted uranium. The rest is stainless steel or tungsten, it's tungsten, sorry. The casing is tungsten, and this tip can penetrate into the armor much more than a tungsten uh, tip. But it's more expensive, too. And, of course, it contaminates your whole field. So, how do we measure in a cheap way the presence of heavy metals and pesticides? The overall effect is uh, acidity in, in the body. And we can measure the acidity in the mouth. I recommend all my patients do the pH before each meal, three times a day, do a table, and compare that to everything they're doing. A 
and most of them that have chronic diseases, the, the, practically all of them will have acidity in the mouth. So the body's trying to balance the presence of these chemicals by taking alkalinity away from areas of the body that are not uh, necessary for survival, like the mouth, so we can detect acidity indirectly indicate, that indicates the presence of uh, toxins like heavy metals, pesticides, petroleum byproducts, plastics in the mouth. And also the effect of our therapies, if it's working, if they're alkalinizing. And you will start observing that in your patients that are not feeling well, they tend to be acidic, most of them. And the ones that feel great, plenty of energy, mental clarity, and sleeping well, which are three of the main things that start uh, not working well when we're polluted, is, is associated with alkalinity. So, and a meal that a patient will do in the morning will reflect itself in, in before lunchtime and in the afternoon. So that helps you help the patient become involved in his care by using this pH de detection system. Now the pH is also detecting electricity. That's what it's doing chemically. So alkalinity is high electricity, acidity is low electricity. We are an electrical battery. And the way that the toxins kill us is by stealing electrons from our body. So all these toxins are stealing electrons and poisoning us. The ultimate electron stealer is cyanide. Cyanide will turn off the body like a switch very quickly. It'll take away your electricity. Huh? You go like this in very fast. So that's how the toxins tend to kill us. And that, that's what makes a, tox, a toxin more toxic than another one, another one. Its ability to steal and neutralize the electrons. So they're positively charged. Because they're positively charged, of course, they neutralize a negatively charged uh, electron that feed, feeds us. So the evolution of the detoxification uh, management in our clinic started with a rejuvenation protocol that we did in the 1990s, 2000, then chelation therapy, a three-hour infusion, then an IV push of chelation therapy. That's what we use right now and been using for the last 10 years. Have any of, do, of you uh, done intravenous chelation therapy? Okay, that's great. Do you do it regularly? Excellent. I give you a challenge today. Do chelation therapy just weekly for six weeks and then report back to me. You'll be amazed how you feel. I mean, don't do anything else. Just do chelation therapy for, yeah, weekly. And you're going to remember this statement. So the, in here, we, we took some patients. That in the 90s, I was starting to hear that detoxification was good for cancer patients. So I started you implementing a protocol in my clinic, and I did it with 48 patients that had lost, uh, that had progressed, I should say, despite chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. Uh, most of them were stage four, so they had not uh, <clears throat> been cured of their disease. 33 were stage four, three on biopsy, but they had had an earlier diagnosis of cancer, and then they presented with metastases. What I mean on biopsy is the metastases. Stage one urine sarcoma, we had squamous cell carcinomas, breast cancer, Hodgkin's patients. Many had failed conventional therapy. Many had failed all three. Six patients had failed all three, and all had progressive disease. So none of them were on treatment. All of them were progressing. That's the important thing. It's not a randomized study, but it, it, we wanted to see if we saw anything. So the initial program consisted in treating them five days a week for three weeks, and then maybe they would do a, a, a maintenance program or not. But all, practically all of them did this three weeks. And the three weeks consisted of the following. Massage for 30 minutes. This is the old aqua massage tables. So every day, massage for 30 minutes. Which, pardon me? Uh, anywhere where they get, right there. She's giving me massages. <laughs> Anyways, the, uh, you can come to the Kotsanis Institute in Dallas or the Hughes Center. We'll be, we'll, I'll be happy to see you <laughs> and put you in one of these programs. That's biofeedback, respiratory biofeedback that measures with infrared your breathing 
and he puts very nice soothing sounds and sights to relax you. This is an ozone machine that we built. You go in naked. Then you have 60 jets that hit you, which is great. It's, it's, it's tremend tremendously comfortable. Warm water, 42 degrees centigrade, makes you sweat. So it's hyperthermia. So it's a sauna steam bath effect. Also, the machine produces ozone that goes into the machine and through the skin into the tissue. I mean, I, I read a lot of that information and we bought machines to try them, but then eventually started building our own machines with RGF Technologies in, in uh, Florida. A steam bath before doing the ozone machine to clean the skin and started to open the pores. And then half hour of this and half hour of the ozone machine. So the massage, massage therapy by a massage, uh, massage therapy by a massage therapist twice a week for one hour. Biofeedback every day. Steam bath, aromatherapy, meditation and prayer, of course. That also was uh, being investigated at the time and seemed to be effective. And daily monitoring by the physician. Intravenous therapy, three times a week with vitamin C, 20 grams. We started with vitamin C, then B1, B6, B12. That formula is in, the, in your handouts. Sterile water, 250 cc's. EDTA, 2 to 6 cc's. So we did this empirically. We didn't know if this was going to work or not, but it made sense from what other people were doing in the United States. So none of this is original. It's just that I put it together from what everybody was doing in the United States that was doing what they call the alternative medicine at the time, integrative, etc. So we would increase the vitamin C from treatment to treatment up to 70 grams per treatment. So the dose range in these patients reached 50 to 70 grams of intravenous vitamin C. The ozone hyperthermia shower that I show you will be five days a week, half hour treatments, 98 to 133 degrees Fahrenheit. The age range of the patients was from 8 to 80 years old, medium 56 years, and medium follow-up was 18 months, and we analyzed 40 patients. 33 completed three weeks, so those are the ones we consider for the main analysis, the 33 that completed the three weeks. Only five completed one week, so we're not analyzing them together because we were looking at three weeks. And two had no ozone hyperthermia. So these 40 we looked at to see how, how they did. So the first group that did it three times a week, the initial tumor response, and tumor response is measure by CAT scan, physical exam, MRI, sonogram, which are the, the four top ways of measuring, and or decreasing tumor markers, CEA, CA2729, uh, PSA, so whatever tumor marker was pertinent for that particular patient. So we saw more than 50% reduction of tumor in 76% of the patients that did it for three weeks, which was a very promising indicator that these things would work for, were good for these patients. Tumor reduction was never taught to me was possible without radiation, chemotherapy, or surgery. So this was a, a major eye-opener for a radiation oncologist, imagine. So B, the ones that did it for one week, 60% reduction, and C, the ones that did not do ozone or hyperthermia still had 50% of those tumors had reduction. So that's very promising. Overall, 72%. However, at 18 months, only 42% had response. So if you don't keep on doing this, they'll go back to growth of the tumor. So three weeks was not enough to cure them, let's say. So they had to continue. And some interesting things we saw is that symptoms always precede tumor response. What that means is that they start feeling better before we see the tumor going down. They start sleeping better and having more energy. Those are the two most common symptoms that a patient will report on. So if you ask a patient about sleep and energy levels and emotional well-being, 
and you don't have a way of following with CAT scans or fancy blood work, this will be an accurate way of knowing if your treatments are working or not. So following those three things are very important. And all patients that respond start looking and feeling better. So we started calling the protocol rejuvenating, for that matter. And this I didn't expect. I started seeing that patients that had high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, autism, hypercholesterolemia, arthritis, uh, will get better before the cancer got better. I mean, sometimes these things will go away, and we will have to be very careful with the insulin in diabetics or high blood pressure medication in hypertensives. We'll have to lower the medicine within two weeks very rapidly because they started getting low blood pressure and low blood sugar. So we started stopping medicine until we'll take them off medicines. So toxins are contributing also to these diseases. That's what the conclusion we had. In this patient, there's a, a metastatic endometrial carcinoma to the lymph nodes in the pelvis. This is a metastasis in the left, another one in the right. You can see it here pushing the, the uh, bladder and the uterus as well. And after the program, you see the reduction of the lymph node here, you see? So it's not a complete response, but it's something worth reporting. It's a marked reduction in the tumor. Another patient with metastatic colon cancer to the lung. Here's the metastasis in the right lung. And after therapy, is uh, also reduced to less than half of the size. <clears throat> this patient with Hodgkin's disease had a reduction also from the outer per, uh, circumference to the inner one in two weeks. This is a patient with a stage four lymphoma and AIDS that had, as you can see, these are the intestines. The really white loops are in small intestine. You see it here, and all these gray dots that are in between those large loops are metastases of a lymphoma. You see the large mass here in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. This is a mass of lymphoma, a mass over here, mass, mass. So he had metastatic lymphoma, which was eroding through the abdominal wall and growing out of the body causing a constant infection. You could put your hand through the abdominal wall. He was actually in diapers, incontinent. He was given the last rites. Again, this doesn't happen with everybody, but uh, here we see a distension of the intestine in that patient. And after four months of, of the program, he continued doing a maintenance. We have a complete response. There's no evidence of tumor. You see how dark it looks here? It doesn't look grayish anymore with those dots that I show you and the mass is gone, but the patient has been now since 1998 in remission, 19 years. So he, he didn't receive uh, chemotherapy, he was progressing, he was stage four, and now we use all the protocols to help our patients. And of course, uh, uh, this is a randomized study done by the National Institutes of Health on cardiovascular disease and chelation therapy. Are you aware of the LAMA study? TACT means trial, to assess chelation therapy. By the way, are you aware of ICD-10 codes? Do you use that? Any of you use the ICD-10? The International Codes of Diagnostics for Insurance Companies. So the ICD-10 that was proposed uh, two years ago included 5,500 codes for chelation therapy for practically all major di chronic diseases in the, in, in the book. All cancers, I saw it. I thought they were going to introduce it. For all cancers, high blood pressure, diabetes, Alzheimer's, autism, they were recognizing it in the, in the preview board. It's an international board. I'm sure the international community recognized that chelation therapy could help with all these diseases, but I'm sure the Americans said, uh-uh, you're not putting those codes in the, <laughs> in the Medicare codes in the United States. So... The proposed codes, which I saw personally, I couldn't believe, 5,500 codes of chelation therapy for, and it was considered up to October of 2015, but they eliminated them. They're not in the final review. But they know. They know that this, 
is, is a potential helper. But at least the study showed that patients that had had one heart attack and did weekly chelation therapy for two years versus the patients that didn't, they just did the regular medications and uh, stents if needed or bypass surgery if needed. The ones that did chelation had less mortality, less subsequent uh, heart attacks, less strokes, less need for revascularization, which is bypass surgery and stents, less angina, hospitalizations, and less use of medication. So it was statistically significant. Conclusion of the study, uh, actually there was reduction, especially in diabetics, of mortality of 39%. So every, anyone that is diabetic definitely has a major indication to do chelation therapy immediately. People that also have high blood pressure, hypercholesterolemia, also. But it was statistically significant, 1,700 patients. You know what the conclusion of the study was? Is that uh, it's too early to recommend chelation therapy yet. So we don't, re cardio the cardiologists that did the study said, we don't recommend chelation therapy yet. Let's make sure it works. So now they're doing the second tax study. The same study, they're doing it again. That doesn't make any sense. But that's what they're doing in the NIH. Lead exposure and progression of renal disease. There's another randomized study with 200 patients with chronic renal failure. The 20% of the population in Puerto Rico has chronic renal failure. So if you know anybody in CFR, CRF, recommend chelation therapy. They did a two-year randomized study. The ones that got chelation weekly for two years, none of them ended up in dialysis versus 27% of the ones that didn't need a dialysis. Also, chelation therapy was able to reverse kidney damage. Why does that happen? Because in this study, they were all biopsied, and they found that the 200 patients had elevated levels of lead in the kidneys. So heavy metals are clogging up the kidneys in, Amer in the United States and Puerto Rico. So chelation therapy is indicated to reverse that process. Yeah. Type 2, yes. Type 1, there's other things we do. So the EDTA is a three-hour infusion we've been doing since 1997, which is 500 cc bags, up to 3 grams of EDTA disodium. That's very important because now we use EDTA calcium. That's the one that you can do with an IV push. And I'll show you how to do that because it's five minutes and it's easier on the patient and more effective. We, we used to use five grams of ascorbic acid, sodium bicarbonate, potassium chloride. This is a formula that is still being used in most chelation therapy centers in the United States, which is okay. This is, this is a reasonable option, but we don't use it anymore. We haven't used it now for about seven years. And we found that the patients that did chelation and traveled less than 35 minutes to the clinic did better than the ones that had to travel more. So if your patients have to travel a lot to go to your clinic, discourage them from doing so. Get a closer center to them or have them stay around your clinic for the duration of treatments. We've been doing IV push detoxification protocols since uh, 2010. And this is the 445 patients we treated with a dose range of IV push chelation, EDTA calcium chelation therapy. So it's very important to differentiate because if I do an IV push of EDTA disodium, I will cause a renal failure. The kidney will stop functioning for maybe 5 to 24 hours. That could kill a patient. So it's EDTA calcium where you can do that. We've done more than now 15,000 treatments. So we're very excited about that because... We've seen reduction in total cholesterol, high blood pressure, cardiac symptomatology, chronic renal failure, diabetes, arthritis. Uh, <clears throat> Ogura and Klinghart in the United States showed that for infections to perpetuate themselves in the human body, you need heavy metals. If you took heavy metals away, Epstein-Barr virus, have you heard of chronic fatigue syndrome? 
which is a very common disease, and other infections will reverse. And you could cure infections easier if concomitant to whatever you're doing to eliminate the infection, you remove heavy metals. And they showed this. And they developed their famous protocol of chlorella by mouth, cilantro that you had to heat up before giving it, and the monastery herbs, detoxifying herbs. You remember those? Those are very effective. You do them for two weeks, your life may change. And a magnet in the mesencephalon, the midbrain, to increase absorption of these things. So those things are very important, and they, and they show they, they showed very well that if you don't remove the heavy metal, your uh, rate of success is not going to be as good. So we have to remove those metals. And of course, you're dealing with infections of the mouth, so preparing the patient, removing heavy metals, intravenous vitamin C. As dentists, you can do these procedures, remember. You, you can do intravenous procedures of this sort, especially if they're nutritional, like vitamin C, vitamins, preparing the patient, detoxifying them. Uh, how many have laws that are clear about that in your state about intravenous uh, support in your dental practice? Are you aware of any? If they're not clear, you're lucky because as long as you make a diagnosis of heavy metals or something like that, you can justify a lot of what you might be able to do. So I encourage you to do that. In Puerto Rico, we have several dentists that do intravenous vitamin C in Florida as well and, and Texas as well. So I encourage you at least to start with that because that's nutrition, it's vitamins. And there's less justification of some of the forces that be to bother your practice. With chelation, well, they may require codes and justifications, but it can also be done. The CPT code, 2014 and 15 and 16, they introduced over 5,000 new diagnoses. When I wrote this, I thought they were going to implement it, but they didn't. So they're recognizing that all this, most diseases were made worse or caused by heavy metals. So monitoring is very important. It's sometimes more important than treatment. If you monitor a patient, for example, in cancer, monitoring is everything. We monitor markers, tumor sizes with sonograms, monthly CAT scans. If we do that constantly, we're going to do fine by our patients. If we don't monitor, if we keep doing vitamin C or chelation without checking the cholesterol, the blood sugar, the blood pressure, the, uh, the tumors, the uh, opening of arteries, we're not helping our patients. So remember, monitoring, monitoring, put that in your head. pH, three times a day, temperature, three times a day, and other markers. So probably the, the slide I presented of the President's Cancer Panel Report, that is one of the most important things. And number two, monitoring, monitoring. Not so much treatment. How many treatments do we have available for our, for our patients? I mean, there's thousands of treatments, but monitoring is important. So we tend to do a lot of organic food, removal of sugar and starches, goji berry that we can get a hold of now, chlorella, probiotics, vitamin C, and instead of goji, enzymes. That combination of four things, digestive enzymes by Marco Pharma, chlorella by many people, Kyoto, Son Chlorella, or Marco Pharma, probiotics by... Many people are very good in vitamin C, uh, Vitality C, uh, Live On that Dr. Levy developed, uh, Prolysing C by Dr. Rath, those three. If you do those four things, you'll see your patients getting alkaline or yourself. So if you have a chronic disease, that's the third slide that I want you to concentrate on. Try those four things, chlorella, digestive enzymes, probiotics three times a day, everything three times a day, vitamin C. Don't do 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C. You're wasting your time. Don't do 3,000 for your patients. I give my 5-year-old 3,000 a day. 5-year-old. So if you're going to take vitamin C, consider 9 to 12,000 a day. So do 3,000 to 4,000 three times a day, and you'll have energy the whole day. Because most of us, by the afternoon, we're falling asleep. And we do if we're working too hard. I mean, that's natural, but it's not natural if you do this type of thing and keep yourself alkaline. I wasn't always energized. When I was uh, 30 years old and in the regular medical world, I was tired every afternoon, needed to take a nap. So naps 
are not a natural thing, although they're fun too. So I don't discourage naps, okay? I encourage them. So, do the above, like the oral treatments, two weeks before doing chelation, because then the chelation will really kick off. Sometimes if you, if you do it at the same time, you won't get the same effect. So start doing the oral, then chelation, to reduce the discomfort from detoxification. I have seen that. So chelation therapy, roughly, we don't give the calculated dose that is based on kidney function, age, uh, creatinine, weight, and height of the patient. But we give 20% of the dose the first week, 40% the second week, 60% the third week, and the fifth week we reach 100%. Because it's so effective, chelation therapy is so effective that if you, if you give even 50% the first week, the patients, many of them will feel weak and tired and sick for 24 hours. Thank God it's only for 24 hours. So we started discovering that we go slowly and that initial load of heavy metals coming out doesn't cause that discomfort. So that, that's an important thing too. So this doesn't exist anymore, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. I have 30 minutes. So calcium EDTA is what we're using now. It's given over a slow 5 to 10 minute infusion. That's what we call it, IV push of chelation therapy. We do weekly injections. We always reevaluate. Remember, monitoring, monitoring every six treatments. And every six treatments, you get a CBC, a CMP20, and a lipid profile. And you will start seeing the effects and will start We'll have to start lowering in most patients the blood sugar medication, whether it's insulin or a hypoglycemic, blood pressure medication in a hypertensive patient, pain medication in other patients like arthritic patients. This is what I talked to you about already. And the results that we've been seeing initially is a lowering of the total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides in 75% of the patients. Now with proper diet and supplements, it's gone up to 87%. So that's very good. Instead of using Lipitor, that is associated with Alzheimer's, by the way. It's associated with dementia. Because these cholesterol-lowering drugs will lower your cholesterol up here as well. So you need cholesterol to think. So that's very important to consider. Uh, disappearance of joint pains in 85% of patients, regardless whether it's a rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, traumatic event, uh, we get that kind of relief. Do you know that the most common, do you know what the most common medical problem in the U.S. is? Anybody? Fatigue? That's a good one. Yes, that's a good one. Pharmaceuticals, that's an even better one. Insomnia, that's a very good one as well. What? Pain? Yes. Where? Back pain. 60% of the population in the United States suffers from chronic back pain. I mean, that's preposterous. You know why? Lack of exercise and eating crappy food too. And of course, the toxicity. Well, we've been able to demonstrate that when you give a patient with a herniated disc, you know what that is? The disc between the vertebral body starts pushing nerves and causing tremendous pain. You can reverse that by giving microcurrent and post-electromagnetic fields to the area. And we documented that with MRIs. So all of this is ultimately a loss of electrons. Disease is a loss of electrons. Depending what your family's Achilles heel is, that's where genetics comes in. You might get high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, depending where your Achilles family heel by genetics is. But the actual cost, loss of electrons from these things. By returning the electrons with microcurrent, detoxification, good diet, post-electromagnetic fields that charge tissues, we've shown that, that back pain can reverse. And the most common cause is herniated discs. So, and of course, more energy and sleeping better, 100% of the patients. By the way, another one way up there in the list is uh, acid reflux. You know how many people are taking protonics and Santac and stuff like that? It's an epidemic. You know why? You know what's the most common cause? 
I think I already told you. Not chewing right, not chewing well. Most people are not chewing. If you chew 30 times, your acid reflux will go away, usually in a day or two. Isn't that amazing? And you can eat rocks, and if you chew 30 times, you, you won't feel the food in the stomach. Has, has any of you feel distended in the last month any time during a meal? Well, you shouldn't. If you chew, come to me and uh, uh, if, if you still get that bloating, come to me and tell me, no, it didn't happen, I still got the bloating. No, I don't think you will. I think you'll do great. Chew 30 times at least. It's going to change your life. Again, I'll repeat it. It's going to change your life. Chew 30 times today, tomorrow, day after. And you can do it very fast. Anyways, decreasing medications in all patients that were in medication. We saw that too, including insulin, hypoglycemics. So that's very good. And decreasing creatinine and urinary protein in 85% of the patients with chronic renal failure. So if you have patients with these things, consider chelation therapy. Side effects, of course, increasing blood pressure in one patient, death of one patient due to bradycardia, but then we found out it was from taking metoprolol. You know what that is? It's an antiarrhythmic and anti-high blood pressure. You know what they're giving the patients with a heart attack in the United States? They're giving them this medicine to lower your blood pressure and heart rate so if your spouse is a pain in the ass and starts messing with you and you start getting angry, it doesn't it doesn't increase your blood pressure so you get a heart attack. But unfortunately, the side effect is bradycardia. So patients are coming to the, my patients are coming to the emergency room by drones. They were, not anymore, because this will lower the pulse to 20 and they will need an immediate pacemaker. The epidemic of pacemaker in the United States is insane right now. And a lot of it is from metoprolol, propanolol, which are beta blockers. That are, and you'll see that you're, you don't get as angry when you're in a beta blocker. It's true. You're pretty mellow because your adrenaline, you don't feel it. This is blocking the adrenaline. So you get excited. You want to break somebody's neck. That's a natural feeling, so don't worry. It's okay. <laughs> you want to kill him, but you don't feel it. And, but there's a price to pay. Your blood pressure is low and also your pulse. If it goes too low, especially in order people, pacemaker and... Renal failure during that bradycardia, low pulse. So they need dialysis as well. It's a mess. Huh? When that patient died, I got depressed for weeks, months, because we thought that the chelation had contributed. But then I started seeing it in all these patients that are taking metropolol. It's from the beta-blocking activity of that drug. And some patients get malaise. We don't get that anymore. One patient had chills from an infected catheter and another patient skin pimples. So the side effects are very reasonable. Now the IV push, we're, we're doing it more. 50 patients in Vieques. They receive EDTA and direct intravenous ozone, 20 gamma. Gamma means micrograms of ozone per cc of uh, oxygen ozone mixture. You use an oxygen tank to produce ozone. 5 to 25 cc's once every two to four weeks, and we did it together with chelation. And 30 patients re received at least 10 treatments. We just did this uh, in Vieques. We didn't charge the patients. We just offered the community to do it and see what happens, see if the diseases in Vieques improved. So we did five-minute infusions every two to four weeks, and we, and we confirmed the Big Island results, lowering of total cholesterol, 85% of the patients, glucose levels, 92% of the patients, Disappearance of joint pains in 95%, more energy and sleeping better in 100% of the patients. Three patients in Vieques that had prostate cancer had a decrease of their abnormal PSA to less of more than four to less than one. And one patient had resolution of asthma and another one resolution of allergies. So we're starting to see confirmation that these heavy metals, when removed, reverse disease, Heavy metals in Vieques associated as well with disease, so we're seeing more and more evidence. So we started treating from the Vieques data of prostate cancer, prostate cancer patients in Puerto Rico with EDTA ozone, and in 18 patients that had a PSA of from 40 to 32, all responded to EDTA and ozone weekly infusions within first weeks. 
within six to 12 months, 17, 18% of the patients uh, remained with PSA reduction of less than one. And these are patients that are, have recurrent prostate cancer, many of them. And they're responding just to removing the, the heavy metals. We're not thinking of petroleum products or plastics, but there's an effect that when you remove a toxin from the body, other toxins that are sticking to the toxin come out because they have an, a, a self-attracting effect. So it's like a train effect. So one patient developed, an aller developed a very severe allergy to EDTA. It's the only one I've seen in my career. But we started desensitizing him, and now he gets chelation therapy and has no more allergies. That patient had a recurrent prostate cancer. He's been in remission for two years, only with chelation and ozone. So we cannot say this is proof, and we cannot. I, I never like to make the claims, but it's extremely it's interesting to the extent that I would recommend it to everyone that has an elevated PSA because the side effects from this are so no, and there's so many other benefits from it. So in these patients in VIECAS, results of adding o intravenous ozone to EDTA seems to be more effective for most diseases, but this has to be studied more. And EDTA with concomitant ozone for removal of heavy metals is associated with improvement or disappearance of many diseases. In conclusion, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, allergies, renal failure, asthma, fatigue, insomnia, we routinely recommend this protocol. And by this protocol, I mean anything that will remove toxins from the body. So if you do the four supplements that you take by mouth, if you do an organic plant-based diet, if you do intravenous vitamin C, if you do chelation therapy, if you do IV push versus three hours, if you do meditation, massage, and uh, prayer. So all those things will help. You want to do as many as possible, but don't overwhelm the patient. You want to be simple. You want to be simple in what you do. And don't confuse them because sometimes in the beginning I used to tell everything to the patient and they will be uh, dizzy by the, by the end of my five-minute presentation of what we were going to do. So now we keep it as simple as possible. So whatever you can do to detoxify them before you do a dental procedure, do so. Because not only are you going to help them, but there are randomized studies that show that intravenous vitamin C before surgery and a dental procedure, I consider surgery. Even cleaning is a type of surgery, is invasive, no matter if you use the sonogram or a little scraper, the patients bleed. Vitamin C has been shown to decrease complications, pain, bleeding, increase the healing, and uh, more importantly, reduce bleeding during the procedure to practically zero. That's amazing because it's constantly regenerating the collagen, which keeps the integrity around blood vessels, for example, and of the blood vessels. So intravenous vitamin C, you will start seeing that your procedures produce no blood, and that's a pain in the butt, you know, the blood, because doesn't give you visibility. It puts you at risk and your staff, so you don't want that. But vitamin C will also kill viruses that are in that blood. It will kill bacteria. I, Dr. Levy has an excellent presentation of the antiviral effects of vitamin C and the documentation behind it. So I'll be happy to give you one presentation about that as well because we do it in our clinic. And Dr. Levy and I did a paper together two years ago. It's in PubMed on the use of intravenous vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide in the treatment of chikungunya in Puerto Rico in 56 patients. We had a rapid reduction of pain. I mean, this is debilitating pain in, in young people too. And we could get the relief within two, three hours during the infusion. That's how powerful vitamin C can be as an antiviral, also as an antifungal, antibacterial. So keep that in mind. If I'm giving you too much information, let me know because Sometimes it's too much. So the second thing is the monitoring. So you want to monitor pH papers to all your patients. That's a great thing. And improvement of chewing because chewing also keeps the teeth healthy. So chewing 30 times. And getting to the vegetables, please. I know it's hard, but there's nothing like disease to get you into healthy things. <laughs> nothing like a crisis to get you back on track. So, 
Tell them to chew 30 times and go to Whole Foods. You have Whole Foods near you, any of you? Whole Foods here in uh, Texas, they have the best salad bar I ever tasted in my life because everything tastes different. That's very important. Not in Puerto Rico. Everything tastes the same in the salad bars. Everything tastes different. They do a different seasoning and it's delicious with everything. Corn and, and the greens and the tomato. Everything tastes different. So try it. Try the organic salad bar. Anyways. Uh, I recommend also removing the amalgams after you do a program like this, let's say for two to four weeks. So you prepare them because you, you know the protocols of removal of amalgams because you're here. But also, it's, uh, things will release anyways. But to even minimize that even more, prepare them with removing what, what's already in their bodies. And you'll see the difference. I, I, I encourage you to do so. So I, I recommend them to do intravenous chelation ozone or vitamin C before removing amalgams as a preparation and everything else I, I share with you today. So thank you very much for, for everything and I appreciate your invitation. Thank you. And thank you for the donation. <laughs>